Please welcome to the stage, dad, consultant, an independent software craftsman, an architect, a programmer, a coach, a personal mentor, a speaker, a writer, and a traveler. We can say a generalist, but also a specialist in the field of Agile. Our next speaker, Sander. Thank you. <clears throat> so, I shouldn't cover that microphone, right? So, good morning, everybody. I'm glad you're all still here and that you didn't go to Jeff's Q&A. Um, yeah, well, he's extremely popular, right? And for right reasons. So, um, this talk is titled, It's a Small World After All. Um, as you can see, I like board games. I actually got this board game from a friend because of the title of my talk. So it's basically the reverse order. So it's going to be about, um, so I've been doing Agile for over 20 years now. I started doing that in the late 90s, uh, even before it was called Agile, but everybody moved in the same general direction. So we started doing that too in the Netherlands. And um, uh, from there, I've seen a lot of Agile projects and a lot of Agile things and a lot of Scrum and a lot of Kanban. Um, and I, there's lots of lessons that I learned from that. That means that I sort of moved on from the basics of Agile some time ago, and this story is a bit about that. It's actually a story in two parts, because um, I'll try to illustrate where this new world is going to, and that consists of four different topics. Now, the fourth topic is the most technical one, and I created a separate talk for that, which I'll do after this talk in the other room, which I don't know where it is anyway. I'll find it. Anyway, so this is me. I'm Sander. Um, I'm basically a, a dad of three. Um, I have a girlfriend. My girlfriend has two more, so I'm a bit busy. Um, and I brought one of my kids here. She's still sleeping in the hotel. She's 23. She has her own life. I'll talk a bit about them as well. Um, um, I'm a programmer. I've started to write code when I was 15, which is like 60 years ago. Um, 70. Um, so, and I've been making money with writing code since I was 19. Now, that's like 30-something years. I don't, cannot do the math anymore. I worked for this company called Capgemini. You might have heard of it. It's, uh, it's kind of large. I don't really like large companies, but uh, so I worked for them for like a decade, and I was their global agile thought leader. Now, that was nice because I get to travel around the world and look at failing agile projects. And you might think, oh, are there failing Agile projects? Yeah, lots of them. Uh, they're not in Jeff's chart, I guess, but there are lots of failing Agile projects. There are, I'll tell you about it. So the thing is that I started to realize over time is that, well, the times are changing, right? This is Bob Dylan, um, and he wrote the song uh, where this line is from in 1964. 1964, the times were already changing, and now, um, in 2019, the times are changing even faster, and they're even changing faster than faster. And I'll show you some examples of that. The first one you might know, this is Moore's Law. Have you seen Moore's Law? Yeah, Moore's Law is quite nice, right? It basically says, the number of transistors in a, close in a dense integrated circuit doubles approximately every two years. Now, if you look at the line on this graph, it looks linear. It looks like, oh, we're going slightly faster. The only thing is, it's not linear, it's exponential. Because, well, the y-axis is actually doubling up, right? So it goes a bit like this, from your, that's from your point of view, right? Yeah, yeah. So it goes faster and faster. And as a result, the possibilities we have in technology change faster and faster too, right? Let me tell, give you some examples. Now, if you would order a desktop computer online in 1954, it looked a bit like this, even though there was no internet, right? Uh, but this was the size of computers. Now, the computer here on screen has far less power than this little machine that I have in my pocket, right? So that was the size of computers in 1954. When I started writing code, I got one of these. This is an IBM 5150. Have you worked on these? Oh, yeah, they were great machines. You know these, um, there's, there's, you can't see it pretty right, but these black, this black area here, it has two slots. You know, there, there's things going in it. I, I occasionally do lectures at universities, and I have to explain what they are, right? And then you can put a floppy disk into it, and people are like, what? A floppy disk? What is that, right? They have no clue. They think everything's on the Wi-Fi, and, um, and you can go anywhere. Well, we can these days, and that's because the world evolved further than this. We got to moving to the cloud in 2006. Amazon introduced 
EC2 in 2006. Microsoft um, introduced Azure in 2007. Now, this opened up a whole new perspective because previously we were writing code for companies to run on their network. And now what happened is that we moved everything out there into the cloud. So that means we moved it from our own storage capacities and from our own code bases and from our own executables running on our own PCs into somebody else's computers. And as a result, innovation sort of exploded. I'll give you some examples of that. So we started disrupting ourselves, basically. Now, if you look at the average adoption rate of new technologies, look at, for instance, airplanes. It took 68 years before 50 million people have flown a plane. It took 18 years before 50 million people used an ATM. And that period of time, the adoption rate went down and down and down. For instance, Twitter took like two years to reach 50 million users. Of course, after that, they'll drop to like 10 users, but uh, they're still there, I guess. And look at the latest technologies. Look at what Pokemon Go did, right? It went to 50 million users in 19 days. That is just amazing, right? If you look at a company like Netflix, you do have Netflix right here, right? Yeah. If you look at Netflix, it's a huge company, right? They have like 150 million subscribers to their services. You know how many data centers they have? Zero. They don't have any data centers. I worked for a client recently. They were building um, uh, streaming sports events. So they were going to be the Netflix of sports. And they wanted to go up to 100 million users in three years' time. They have no hardware whatsoever. The only thing is they have is every developer that comes in gets a laptop. That's it. That's the only hardware they own. Now, that is where we are going to. And that means, as a result of that, that the world is going to change. The world is going to change in every industry. Now, Jeff already mentioned some examples from banking. I have some more. Or basically, maybe even the same. So this nice graph here is the fintech startup thing in the Netherlands. There's 430 startups in the Netherlands alone in fintech. What if one of these decides to be an online bank? How much time and effort would that take? I can tell you. It takes five developers, a product owner, a UX designer, two testers for about a year, and then you have enough software to be a bank. Now, that is scary, right? If you are a large international bank, you might be scared of this. You should be, by the way. Like, in the UK, you have a bank called Monzo. They do this. In Germany, there's a bank called N26. They do the same. And they have transparent credit cards. That is cool, right? Um, or, or even Apple, right? Apple is joining in, too. Because what's happening is that the large companies that have a multitude of teams also know how to do this. So I'm sorry this is in Dutch, but this is the CEO for ING. And the CEO for ING says, well, um, these fintech startups don't really scare me. It's the big companies that scare me. Those will be our competitors, the Apples, the Amazons, maybe even Facebook, if they still exist in 10 years' time, right? And um, the same goes for Apple, by the way. Anyway, so Apple jumped in, right? And they created their own payment card. And it's really nice, actually, because if you look at it, there's nothing on it. Just your name and some chip, right? There's no expiry date. There's no number on it anymore. I don't even know how to do this, but they do it, right? That's pretty cool. So everybody can come into any market. Whether you are a startup or whether you are a very large company already doing a lot of payments, like the fact that Amazon does loans in Germany, that must really scare the shit out of all the banks in Germany, right? Um, and, um, and even from other industries as well. There's an airline company called AirAsia that starts to do payments and banking as well. Why? Well, because they can. Even though banking is boring, they still jump into it. Right? So that means we get to a world where anybody, anywhere, at any point in time, can move into any industry. So for any company out there, this must be really, really scary. Right? I work for a company, small company now called QB. It's an IoT company, that, uh, um, an IoT startup, actually, that builds smart thermostats. Now, they do lots of nice things with the data, because that's where their services are around, so they can predict when your boiler breaks down and stuff like that. But if you look at what Google is doing currently in the home, uh, the smart home uh, market, they feel 
the breadth of Google in their necks, right? So they need to go faster. They need to innovate. And that goes for most companies I work with. And to innovate and to become faster, you need to do a bunch of things. And these bunch of things, I can actually sum it up into four different items. And these items are, basically, you need to move away from doing projects. Because projects are too slow. Projects, doing projects as a metaphor in this industry, that has always failed. And I'll explain why. So you should stop doing projects. You should move to building small services and put them out as fast as possible. The message is actually not that different from Jeff's message this morning. To do that, you need to move to even shorter cycles. The shorter your cycles can be, the more often you can put stuff out into production, the faster you go. The easier it is to change, the easier it is to disrupt yourself. Also, you need to work in maybe even smaller teams. And given the complexity of software development these days, I doubt it that the current size of teams actually will do it, but I will talk about that. And the fourth one is you need to build smaller components. That is, you need to live in architectures that allow you to continuously put stuff into production. That is, you need to move away from big monolithical systems into the world of microservices, which is the talk I'll do next after. So I'm going to touch on the first three now. So let's start with saying, OK, let's talk about these services. To do that, I'm introducing this model to you. Have you seen this before? It's the Kinefin framework, right? This is a really cool framework. And once I started uh, um, uh, getting this, um, it made a lot more sense to my world, actually. So I'm going to explain it to you as well. First of all, this model was written down by a guy called Dave Snowden. He's a professor in Wales. He wrote it while he was working for IBM. And he says, well, you can divide problems into four different contexts. Now, the obvious context, which is here, um, basically says, well, if you have a particular problem, there is a best practice. There's only one best practice. The only thing you need to do is apply that best practice, and you're on to the next step. You can solve the problem. These are easy problems, right? For instance, if my sink is full of dishes, I need to put them in the dishwasher and turn on the dishwasher. There is no other solution. My kids don't do that, actually. I try to get them to do it, but they won't, um, which is pretty hard, actually. But so there's only one solution. You need to do that. Now, the second context, which is called the complicated context, uh, is basically a situation where you have a particular problem, and there's different possible good practices. For instance, if you have to do identity management, you can build it yourself, which is really nice, but also really hard. You can go through one of the more smaller vendors in your own region. We have in the Netherlands, we have quite a few of those. Um, or you can go to, let's say, Amazon or Azure or wherever you want to go. And then you need to think about federated login, et cetera, et cetera. So this is a situation where there is a number of good practices, and you have to do a lot of analysis on that and figure out which one to take. And after that, you can implement it and build it, et cetera, et cetera. This is typical the context where we use Waterfall or where we used to use Waterfall. Because the thing is, as I tried to explain earlier, is that everything changes really, really fast. And it will change faster tomorrow than it does today. And it will change even faster in the day after that. That means the whole situation of saying, we have this problem, we can take the time to analyze it, think about it, and then after that, build some stuff, and then after that, test some stuff, is long gone. We are not in that situation. We have never been in software development in that situation. We are either in complex zones, and the complex zone is an interesting one, or we are in chaotic zones. Now, the big difference between the two is that in a complex zone, if you have a general direction where you want to go, let's say the dot at the horizon, you can start moving there by taking small steps. Do an experiment, see if it works. If it works, move in a general direction. If it doesn't, you slightly start to change stuff but you still move in a general direction. You could also be in a chaotic context. That's even worse, because if you cannot find the dot at the horizon, you have no clue where to go. The only thing you can do is take small steps, and hopefully, eventually, some strategy or some vision will emerge. If you don't have a goal, you need to start experimenting as well on the road to finding that goal, and then move up into the complex context. Now, the thing is, in software development, 
Most of us, and probably most of you here in the room, are in one of the two zones on the left side, not on the right side. That means the world is unpredictable. That means the world of doing projects is over in software development and in product development too. Now, to summarize it up, a friend of mine came up with four short things. This is like, the. of course I need to do that. And the second one is basically, ah, that's the one. That's the one we're going to do. And if you're in a complex one, it's like, huh? And the fourth one is basically this, right? It's like, I have no clue where to go. So you need to take this into account. Now, the interesting thing is that Dave Snowden, the author of the, of the uh, framework, well, he's not on this slide, so basically I'll skip this one. So basically, most of us will be either here or here, right? Now, the interesting thing about it is that these zones, if you are in these zones, are perfect for innovation, are perfect for driving into small steps and see what the next step is and see where you want to move. And Dave Snowden says, in the chaotic context, searching for right answers would be pointless. There are no right answers. There's only experimentation, figure out what the next step is, and move on from that. It's basically how I run my life, by the way. The relationships between cause and effect are impossible to determine because they shift constantly, and no manageable patterns exist. So there is no known knowledge. So you cannot say, there's this list of solutions, we'll pick one and then we'll move on. You have to identify it. And as technology changes so fast, the solution you pick today might be gone tomorrow. So you need to move in very, very small steps. Also, he says, the chaotic domain is nearly always the best place for leaders to impel innovation. Now, that is good, right? Because we can innovate. That means no more of this. If you are still doing this at your current company, stop doing it, please. Because that era has long gone. We shouldn't do this because it doesn't fit where we are. Also, these large and detailed plannings that you might have, throw them away. Just throw them out the window because they never work, right? Yes, projects are always late. It's because things change all the time. You have to take that into account. Waterfall, detailed plannings, they don't do that. So they're the wrong metaphor for what we do. What we do need to do is move in very small and continuous steps. Instead of saying, I'm going to deliver a big monolithical application, maybe the new release every three months, or every half year, or every year, it's too slow. If you move at that pace, somebody else will come into your industry and disrupt the industry. Make your, do the same as you do, but faster, shorter, cheaper, or disrupt the whole industry, like a company like Uber did, or Booking. They are very disruptive in their fields. So that means stop moving into big blocks and try to put them into production, getting this whole bunch of integrated testing that you need to do before you can put it out, because the delta is really big, and move into really small and independent blocks and deliver them all the time. Right? That is the thing to go to. To be able to do this, by the way, you need to put a lot of things in place, and I'll talk about that. So my message here is stop doing projects. They're the wrong metaphor. We should have never been in this place, by the way, because the waterfall original white paper says something very differently, actually. So what's the next thing you need to do? Well, the next thing you could do is look at the cycles. Now, I know most of you are in Scrum projects, and that's really, really good, because the cycles are already much, much shorter than in traditional cycles, right? Instead of saying, I have a one-off cycle in a waterfall project of two years, you have now gone back to two, maybe three, maybe four-week sprints which is a large improvement. But the thing is, if you want to be even more competitive, if you need to go faster to stay ahead of your competition, you might want to shorten those cycles. Right? Now you think, oh, can we have one week iteration? Sure, why not? But if you look at skipping sprints and iterations and just moving to implementing individual work items and putting them into production, um, um, so as just, uh, Jeff said at Amazon, they go into production more than once a second. That's, that's amazing, right? But I tell you, even smaller companies, because I don't work for these large companies. I work for smaller companies. And if you set up everything right, that means have your continuous delivery set up right, all your tests automated, all this stuff, you can actually do this too. My previous client was a company of 150 people. We could go to production with any of our microservices at any point in time in the day. And we did. We just didn't need to go any faster because 
There were no requirements coming in that allowed us to go that fast. But we could go literally every second into production with stuff. Right? And that changes the perspective a lot. So that means, if you look at cycles, a lot of people think, and, and I have been thinking this in the field for a long time, um, that Agile equals Scrum. It doesn't. Scrum is one of the frameworks. It's the most popular framework, and there's good reasons for it. So I like Scrum a lot because it gives me a good vocabulary on everything that's in Agile projects. Um, but also what I see is that a lot of people have come into the field in the last 20 years, um, and they, when you first come into a new field, you lack the experience to do the stuff you need to do. To give you some example, if you would do karate, for instance, now, I figured out recently only that my girlfriend, so this is from the karate kid, right? My girlfriend did karate at a really okay level. She was a 17 times Dutch champion. I didn't know that, by the way, when I um, started dating her. Uh, she's probably dangerous, but, uh, well, she is actually. But, um, so I asked her, so how much time does it take you to become a karate master? She says, well, I only practiced for five hours a day for 10 years, and I'm still not a master, right? Now, if you come into the Agile field, and Scrum as an example, again, I have nothing against Scrum, it's just an example, you take a two-day course, you do a 30 questions multiple choice exam, and you're done, right? That means you're now able to coach all these projects. So what happens a lot in the field worldwide, everywhere, is what I see is a lot of people applying Agile approaches and Scrum and Kanban and whatever you might have, FDD or well, any of the other ones, uh, in, in, a, in a seemingly dogmatic way. That means they apply it in a way that they say um, it's authoritative, the Agile approach you're using, and not to be disputed, doubted, or diverged from by the practitioners or believers. That means people actually take everything that's, for instance, in the Scrum Guide, take it literally and say, no, you have to do it exactly like this. Otherwise, you're doing it wrong. And my point is, if the world is moving so fast, then doing things slightly different than is in a written down framework or approach might be the best option for you, right? So you always have to keep thinking for yourself. I'll give you an example. This is a burn down chart from a project in Belgium. So not to, actually, I like Belgium, but, um, and what you see here is they estimated the work and then the ideal line goes up to there. And in the end of the sprint, they had some work left. And, um, and the project manager said, what? what? You should have the potentially shippable product increment now. Well, what's this? Why don't you have all the work done? Can't you estimate? And people said, well, we did our best. And then the second sprint came along, right? And they were like, oh, again, they had work left. And the third, and the fourth, and the fifth, and the sixth. Any one of these sprints, as the project manager said, had failed. And they called them red sprints. And we're like, yeah, so you suck at what you do. You're stupid developers. You don't know how to write code. You don't know how to estimate your own work. Well, the truth is, we don't, because it changes all the time. How do you estimate stuff that changes all the time? We don't know how to do that. So maybe we shouldn't is the right reason. What he did, by the way, is he fired the whole team, and he hired 300 developers from India to finish the work. <laughs> now, as you all know, Brooks Law fits in, right? Um, adding more resources to the late project makes the project even later. Um, and he didn't know that. Well, of course, the project failed miserably, and the project manager was fired, um, as he should have been earlier, and this whole thing backfired. But this is a lot of times what I see happening. The trouble is, you cannot just say, okay, here's a snowboard, and here's some boots, get up on the hill and come down. This is my girlfriend and one of my sons trying to do that, actually. They were like, oh, we can ski, we know how to do snowboarding, we'll go up the hill and we come down. It took him half a day to come down the hill. And I, I stayed on my skis because I didn't want to learn how to board, so I was like down in five minutes on the same hill, right? It doesn't work like that. You have to gain a lot of experience to become good at something. For instance, skiing or playing guitar or whatever, playing the drums or do agile approaches. It takes a lot of experience to get there. Now, there's even more. So the Agile Manifesto, it actually says that what is important is to satisfy the customer by, um, uh, through early and continuous delivery of valuable software. And it basically says continuous. So it does not say every two weeks. It does not say every four weeks. It does not say every six months. It says continuous. 
The only problem is that most industries and most companies, they don't know exactly how to get there. And it's really, really hard to get to continuous delivery because it takes a lot of work and a lot of practice and a lot of energy because there's lots of stuff you need to rearrange, right? But it is worthwhile. Um, it is worthwhile to be able to say, I can actually go to production with my stuff at any point in time and day that I want. If you can tell that to your customers, you have a very different discussion with them, right? You don't have to answer the questions like, how long does it take you to implement these four features? And you say, well, we don't know exactly because the technology is changing. Um, and then the customer says, I need to know whether it's done in three months or in six months and how much money I'm going to spend. Uh, if you can talk to these people, because that's horrible conversations, right? If you can just say to them, listen, we're going to build the first one. Once it's done, we know how long it will take. It will take us a couple of days, maybe a day. And from there, we'll take it on piece by piece. And we deliver to you every piece of that solution into production as fast as we can. Which is, by the way, in two days, you get the first piece. Right? So the whole conversation changes from that if you start doing that. Now, um, this, is, this is a nice one. I, have, I, I still have it on my slide. I can't find the newer editions of this research, but this research being done, people have, have actually filled in the inquiry, and in 2014, there's this interesting result here that says 13% of organizations that voluntarily answered the inquiry did not go into production with anything. Does that... Is anybody in such a situation? Does anybody in 2018 not go to production with software? Right. We moved on, right? We went faster than that. And here, it's only in 2015, it's only 4%, right? So we get better at this. But to be able to do this, I would debate that, um, so I'm not saying use Jira, by the way. Um, a lot of people do. Uh, I'm not advocating Jira. It's a tool, there's numerous tools. But I'm actually advocating saying, what if you would move to a slightly more continuous flow? So I'm not going to say it's for everybody now, because not everybody is already alpine skiing, right? So the thing is, if you move to a continuous flow, you start measuring things differently. The only thing you need to do is to get your items from the left on the board to the right on the board as fast as possible. Right? You can measure that. So you can say, oh, on average, it takes us about four days to get something from the left to the right. How can we improve? We can improve by moving to three days, or half a day even, right? If that is the cycle, you can continuously improve on doing that. And yes, if you think about, hey, that looks like Kanban, here's another board game, there's actually a Kanban board game. I found it in a shop in Utrecht in, in, in the Netherlands. Uh, the description on it looked terrible, by the way, not at all what I would expect from Kanban. So the thing with Kanban is, yes, it's good, because Kanban basically says, visualize the process you have, so the steps you take and from there, try to optimize that process. So I'm not saying use this process, because Kanban does not have or prescribe a process. Figure out what your process is, and put it out in a, in a, a continuous board like this, and make sure you pass the items from the left to the right. right? Now that's the thing to do. Um, to be able to do that, you need to automate a lot of things. You need to, this is, by the way, this is a Jenkins pipeline. And this is an actual one from one of my clients. And what you see here is that if I check in my code, it starts building, it starts running all my unit tests, which, by the way, I always automate all, all the tests. Um, and once it's built, it moves to SonarCube to do static code analysis. Once it's through the static code analysis, we put it into a Docker container, we deploy it somewhere, we test the API to it, and we take the next step to, de uh, um, uh, to deploy it somewhere else again and put it into integration test. All these tests are automatic. And once it's in acceptance, we run all the performance tests on it. Now, basically, that means if I check in my code, it takes about, so what would it be in total, like four and a half minutes to actually move into my production environment. And that's a fully automated process. And you need to fully automate that, because if you run into a continuous flow, and if you start moving smaller blocks of code out there, maybe called microservices, which I'll talk about in half an hour, um, they will actually, you will actually need to test everything automatically. So from a QA and test perspective, the world changes a lot, because you need to learn how to write code. Because having all of these manual tests, as on the typical test cone, with little unit tests and some more integration tests, and lots of manual tests, you will not be able to deliver fast. You need to move to, um, having everything automated. So 
The shortest feedback cycle is when you have a lot of unit tests, right? So you need to write unit tests for all of your code. And I know if I ask the question to groups of developers, do you actually do this? All of them raise their hands, and I know for sure half of them is lying. Because <laughs> we are still not there yet, but we should move into this general direction, right? And that means you can look at um, your code coverage, for instance. Now, this is a small component from one of my recent clients. It's a microservice that has 3,000 3, lines of code, which is seemingly small, especially considered since it's Java. Um, and it has 342 unit tests running on it, with a test coverage of 97%. That's pretty high, actually. That means that if I do a change to this code, and it's tested, I'm pretty sure that it's OK, especially since it's after that tested automatically in, um, in, in regression and integration and system tests, et cetera, et cetera. So that means if you look at that, um, this is a nice tweet by John Cutler. He says, well, basically, the only process that remains, if you start doing this, is, well, you sit down maybe every morning, have a sort of conversation about what you're doing and what it is the other people are doing. Um, you agree to do something small, do the work, deliver it, go out again, and come back to the next morning. That is a highly minimal process. In the end, so I'm not saying do this now, but in the end, most organizations will slowly move towards these minimal processes that are much more minimal than we do even have now. So again, this is alpine skiing, right? So, and from there, you can stop doing projects. So, what else? Well, let's talk about teams for a bit. You're all in agile teams, right? Right, good, so that's good. Now, what I realized is, and that was only recently, actually, that I said, so I've been doing Agile for a long while. The Agile Manifesto came out in 2001. Most of the Agile approaches are from the 90s of the previous century, so they're like 20 years old. Now, as a programmer, I don't write code anymore in the same languages that I did 20 years ago. They have evolved, they've gotten better. Right? We moved from all sorts of traditional stuff into OO, into functional programming, into lambdas and services and whatever we do now, right? and dynamic languages. And the same goes for software development approaches. They have evolved as well. The only thing is, if you stick to using metaphors that we used 20 years ago, they might not solve all of their current problems. I'll show you some of the problems we currently have. The first one is about autonomy and self-organization. As Jeff already stressed out, self-organization is pretty damn important because it allows teams to make decisions at the right level where they should be made, not at some executive level four, four floors up, right? If you go to say to an executive and say, oh, should we use WebStorm, IntelliJ, or Visual Studio, or Visual Studio Code? And you let them make the decision, first of all, it takes a week, and then they make the wrong decision. It's your responsibility, right? So you should be able to do that. To do that, you need to become autonomous. And autonomy is really, really hard. Usually, if I say to teams, dudes, or girls, or both. Or, um, you need to learn how to decide for yourself. You're now autonomous. You know what the first question is they ask me? Um, what do you want us to do? And how do you want us to do it? And we're like, figure it out yourselves. And the trouble is, you can give the autonomy, but the question is, is it the right level of autonomy? At some point, you need to let go. It's the same with my kids. That's why I had my 19-year-old my son on the slide here. He's a drummer, which is nice, because I live in a very small house with two houses attached to us, and my neighbors really like it. But he went to university in September, and he said, after a month, he, he found a nice study called Politics, Economic, and Philosophy. Sounded nice. And after a month, he came back, and he said, Dad, um, this is not what I want to do. I want to become a professional drummer. I'm like, ooh. Um, and my fourth, first thought was, well, having a good study is really important for your future. And my second thought was, no, follow your heart, right? Follow your gut instinct. If this is what you need to do, do it. And that is trying to give the right level of autonomy to people. And that's really, really hard. I'll show you some examples. For instance, if I give you the assignment to draw an owl, I'm not that good at drawing. I said, well, start off with two circles, and the rest of it, figure it out yourselves, right? That is hard. Um, also, a lot of companies go way over the top. Would you want to work at a place like this? Or maybe you do. I don't know, right? 
So this is at Zappos in the U.S. And they came up, they said, well, all the teams are autonomous. And they have to decorate all of their rooms like if they were at home. This is the, my home doesn't look like this, by the way. Um, it's terrible. This is why people start wearing noise cancellation headphones, right? Communication is out of the door here. I'll give you one more example. This is my girlfriend's leg. This is not at the IKEA. This is at a very serious retailer in Rotterdam. Um, and they have, she's on a job interview for a very high management role. She's in a glass room that is filled with balls up to here, right? This has nothing to do anymore with autonomy or self-organization. This is just stupid, basically. I hope none of you work for them. You probably might, but anyway. So, and the thing I did figure out is this, is that if you can give people fewer rules than you might be used to, they will start doing this, right? Let me give you an example. I was in Indonesia in October, I think, and I, w I visited Sumatra, which is a big island, and I visited the biggest city there. Actually, I went through it in a car. I didn't drive myself, by the way. And we had to cross a crossing to the right somewhere there. Now, as you can see, there's lots of rules implied on traffic here, right? There's no lines on the road, there's no signs, there's no stop signs, there's no speed limits, there's no directions, there's nothing, basically. You can see that? And now we're crossing the road. This is, like, dangerous. It feels dangerous, though. The only thing is, by the way, there was a traffic light that both is green and red. I have no clue what that means, actually. And there's no rules. And what do people do here? What do you think they do? They self-organize. They communicate, right? That is what they do. They continuously communicate with the other participant in traffic. And then we cross the, tr the, the, the crossroads, right? Without any damage. Of course, a lot of people get killed in self-organizing traffic, right? But, um, and in the whole city, this was basically the only traffic light that I saw. There lived three million people live in that city. <laughs> That's terrible, right? I'll show you the crossroads as where I live. That's this. There's lots of rules, lots of traffic signs. It is even more dangerous in the Netherlands now to drive through a green light because nobody pays attention than to drive through a red light. If you drive through a red light, you're damn sure you, have, you pay attention to the rest of the traffic, right? That's terrible. We have too many rules. And if I want to give people autonomy, I have to give them less rules. And that's hard for managers, right? So luckily, I'm not a manager. Next problem is working 9 to 5. That is terrible. First of all, I have trouble getting out of my bed in the morning. But second of all, I stand in traffic from Utrecht to Amsterdam every day like this, especially when it rains. On the other side of the highway, this is a five-lane highway, there's people going in the opposite direction. They're going from Amsterdam to Utrecht. They're also standing still on the highway. Why are we still doing this? Why don't we have less rules and say, you know what? You better read your email first before you get to the office, because that saves a lot of traffic. Traffic is becoming a serious problem in Europe, and in most of the world, actually. So we should try and solve this too, right? Agile doesn't solve it. Also, I like the term resources, don't you? We are all resources. Ugh. I always ask managers, like, what, what do you mean by resources? You mean chairs, tables, or computers? Oh, you mean people. Right. Why don't you say that? Anyway, so there is a low availability of people in this industry worldwide. On my current company, there's people of 28 different nationalities out of 110 people. People come in from everywhere to, do, to help out because it is impossible to find the right people at the right place. Also, with the right skills. I'm going to skip this one because it's in Dutch, unless you can read Dutch. It basically says that the market for IT is very, very tight, and it's a big problem. All right. So what do you do? Well, you become T-shaped. You have to move to a situation where you know some stuff about many things and a lot of stuff about a few things. Because if you are all like that in a team, that means you can actually help each other out on the spots where you have little knowledge about stuff, and you combine that with other people who also have little knowledge, and you grow really, really fast. So most of the people in the teams, they're not just developers or just QA people or testers or UX designers. They do all sorts of stuff. And we need to because basically software development has become too complex anyway, right? Also, we're not good at communicating, right? We're IT people. We're a bit shy. 
uh, and we don't like to communicate with everybody and everything. And so, and then what do we do? We put people in lots of meetings. A terrible amount of meetings. There's so many of these events in agile approaches that you can be in meetings the whole day. I'm trying to work on a use case model with the guy sitting next to me. Now, I'm gone for two weeks already, but he's never there. He's always in meetings. How do you get work done when everybody's continuously in meetings? We should have less of them, basically. And the thing is, if you can work with less people on a team, so even smaller than maybe six or seven people, just two or three doing individual work items, if you pull them from left to right on the board, you don't need everybody on that the whole team to work on that. You can say, I'm going to form a small team of two people doing that, delivering that particular work item. And because it's just the two of us, we can actually decide on how we do this, when we do this, where we do this. We can even decide not to come to the office, but stay at home and work from home, or go to a pub and work from there. Right? So smaller teams basically helps. So the thing is, we don't need more collaboration. We need better collaboration. Right? That means fewer people working on the same item. Um, and that means all of these big, day-long refinement sessions that lots of teams have, with 12 people in the room, are very expensive. Also, very ineffective. Because if you could take item for item, the ones that you just are building, and you do the design on that, and just on that, it only takes two to three people, which makes it a lot more efficient. Right? So, um, and then there's the open floor spaces. Um, lots of people are in open floor spaces. Do you like them? No, nobody does, right? Also, there's research being done is that they're not effective. They ruin your productivity. So, we have to find better solutions for these stupid open floor plans. The only reason we have open floor plans is because it looks good in the brochure, right? Oh, come and work at our, at our office. Look at our office. There's people playing ping pong next to my desk. <laughs> How do you write code when people play ping pong or table foosball next to your desk? I've seen companies that actually have that, right? It's just <laughs> I like playing ping pong, though. Don't get me wrong, but not next to my desk, right? And there's everybody puts on their headphones and nobody communicates. The only way the developers still communicate to each other, even when they sit next to each other, is through Slack. Right? You're saying like, Ah, should we go out for lunch? And then the other one says, good idea. <laughs> that actually happens, by the way. We have a, a specific lunch channel on Slack. As you, <laughs> no, it's, really, it's really true. So stop doing that, basically. Also, we suck at estimation. Now, I, this is not, it doesn't surprise you, right? So I'll tell you a quick solution for it. Stop doing it. What? Overestimate. We do that all the time, by the way. No, uh, actually, uh, are you a developer? Yeah, developers underestimate by 20%. There's research being done. I do that too. Um, but I'll tell you, we can stop do this. Because there is a thing called the law of large numbers, which is a pretty cool thing. It basically says it's a theorem that describes the result of performing the same experiment a large number of times. So that's basically estimating stories or tasks or whatever you do, right? According to the law, the average of the results obtained from a large number of trials should be close to the expected value. Now, um, th this is probably a very complicated sentence if you read it for the first time. Basically, this theorem says, um, let's estimate, if you estimate 100 items on a scale from 1 to 5, as an example, right? You take 100 items, estimate it on a scale from 1 to 5. What do you think the average outcome will be? Three, because that's the average, right? And if you take an even larger group of items you estimate, like a 1,000, you get even closer to three. So that means estimating, even on a relative scale, does not add value. That is, we can just stop doing that, right? You can just basically say, OK, planning poker, really nice. Do you play planning poker? Oh, do you like it? It's a good waste of time, so it's good. So the same goes for t-shirt sizing and of any of these things. You can just stop doing this because you can just count the items instead of estimating them because it gives you the same result. The only thing is they have an average of one instead of an average of three. 
right? But if you move them to the board independently already, you're good, right? So that's it. So um, one more is that um, software development is complex. Uh, two more, actually, and then I'll go to the um, uh, retrospective. So we figured out a long time ago, so this is Edgar Dijkstra, he's a famous computer scientist, that software development is complex. And Dijkstra basically says, the programmer has to be able to think in terms of conceptual hierarchies that are much deeper than a single mind ever needed to deal with before. He basically says, software development is the most complex thing we can do as humans. It doesn't fit in our head anymore. I used to be able to do that. Like 30 years ago, I could write the code, it run on my machine, done, right? But these days, if you look at all the stuff you need to know to write code or put it into production, it's just terrible. It's amazing how much you need to know. I'll give you an example. I just, uh, not this one, but this one. I did an investigation two weeks ago about all the technologies that my current client is using. There's no way you can do this in a small team, right? You need to do stuff in a different way. You need to think about where to move, right? And it means if you pick up individual items with small teams, you only require a small subset of those, uh, of those things. Also, we don't seem to be able to work from nine to five either, right? Our heads don't work like that. Because software development is a creative field. And in a creative field, it basically means that you get ideas the whole day long. They don't stop when you go out to lunch. They don't stop when you go home at five. I get most of my ideas when I'm in the shower, in my car, running or walking in a city or whatever I'm doing, right? Even when I'm talking on stage, my mind is continuously going on and figuring out new stuff. It's the way we work. So you have to be able to promote that. That is a change again, right? Now, the last thing that I need to touch on is and this is basically coming down to what's the message for today, is that any of these Agile frameworks are okay. Although most of them don't solve most of these recent, more recent problems we have, um, they are actually okay. I have like one minute. Oh, my clock says 42 seconds. I'm, I'm going to take two minutes over time. Is that okay? Thank you very much. Yeah, well, <laughs> I tried. So it's, it's probably three, right? So I'll try. Anyway, so yes, they are OK. Yes, small teams are OK. But if you look at what happened over the last couple of years in these agile communities and these agile approaches, are we still doing it in the right way? So Scrum, yes, is a really nice, good framework. And you could take it and use the vocabulary and start learning from there, right? Learning from a particular framework means that you will adapt it too. Because in every retrospective, you don't only you look at the way you do stuff, but also in the way you use your framework. And for every one of you, it might be different than from anybody else. So how do you scale Agile? I really don't know, because it depends on your organization. It's a not a one-size-fits-all. Or even worse, you have these enterprise Agile frameworks that have lots of roles. Like DAD, these are the roles in DAD. How do you build software in such a complex organization? Well, you can't. Or here's another one. It's called SAFE. Have you heard of SAFE? Any of your clients doing SAFE? Yeah? Oh, good. No. I'll tell you why. Um, try and find the customer. This is my regular quiz. I'll put up the SAFE picture. And you'll find the customer, right? Somewhere small on the right, right? It's there. It's the person being hit by the train, right? SAFE is too complex to deal with software development. It just doesn't work. Also, Spotify is a very nice model. I like the Spotify model a lot, but it was written down for Spotify in 2014. Spotify is an extremely fast-growing company that needed a model to do this. They grow by 800 times every year or something, right? Also, they wrote this down in 2014. That means their way of working has evolved from this. So if you're working for a company that says, we are going to implement the Spotify model, you're doing it wrong. Because you're not Spotify. You're not a company. You're not as fast growing as Spotify is. You're not as big as Spotify. You don't stream media. That means what you need to do is figure out for yourself where you are and what it is your company needs. And from there, 
pick the most basic framework you can use, probably Scrum, and move on from there to become faster, more autonomous, et cetera, et cetera. So short, very short wrap up, if I can find the right slide. Yes. So I'll do the fourth part um, after the break, if I still have a voice left. So here it is. I need to do a retrospective. Everybody needs to do a retrospective, right? So here it is. We are not in complicated and obvious zones. We are either in complex or in chaotic zones, meaning the world travels too fast to get stuck in waterfall projects or in projects whatsoever. The only thing you can do is actually think for yourself. This is a nice quiz. I was at a conference in Romania, and they asked me this quiz. I could win a T-shirt, so it was important. And they said, well, what do you recommend for refining the backlog? And I looked at the answers, and I said, any one of these four is good, depending on the situation. I was like, that's a cool answer, right? And they said, no, it's B. <laughs> or C, or whatever. I don't remember anymore. But I was like, no, nah, well, it depends on the situation. So here's the thing. You should always keep on thinking for yourself, not just adopt um, somebody else's framework because it's there, and just stick to it for the rest of your life to move away from the dogmatic approaches of Agile frameworks and figure out how to do this stuff yourself. And if you're thinking, oh, I'm just a developer, I cannot change my organization, you can, because change starts with yourself, right? It only takes one person to park his car the other way. I actually tried it out a couple of weeks ago, <laughs> literally. At my son's football, I came in, and we were waiting to, I was the first, that never happens, but, and then I turned my car the wrong way and waited for the other to arrive. And they also started doing this, right? So if you want to change something, it's you that needs to do that, right? And to do that, you always need to continue to learn. And always you need to have fun. And the, all the, last, the very last remark is, you need to stop doing these stupid projects, right? Thank you for indulging me. Three minutes over time. Oh, wait, don't go away. I need to take a picture. Go. Cool. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, we don't have time for questions, but maybe you can use your next, next oh, lot. I'll, I'll, I'll be here for as long as there's beer. <laughs> Thank you very much.